Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Great. Everybody well today? Amen. It sure is good to see you on this beautiful, bright, sunshiny day. Amen? Amen. I am glad you're here today. God has given us something, to, uh, give me something to share with everybody today, and I pray God's going to move in your heart and move in the lives of those who are even watching by, by internet today. And We have uh, something we want to do special today. There's a special lady in here today and uh, you know today is her birthday and uh, Gail I can't let you get by without standing up T today is your birthday <laughs> today is Gail's birthday Amen. all right let's sing happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Gail, happy birthday to you. God bless you. Is everybody doing good today? Everybody well? You ready to worship the Lord today? All right. Um, Let's not forget we have church tonight, and if you'd like to be here, we, we're doing a series of sermons on life, and uh, we are, I'm enjoying the preparation of that. It's, it's very interesting. Life is very interesting, isn't it? Amen. And uh, it has a lot of things that um, we, uh, um, <laughs> we don't understand, but I'm going to try to make you understand some of those things tonight. So if you'll come back tonight, I have... I have something to feed you with today, okay? All right. Anybody have an announcement you'd like to make? I do, preacher. Okay. We're having a choir retreat on the last Sunday downstairs in the fellowship hall at 3.30. If you would like to come and join us, please let us know. We would love to have you come and uh, be a part of the choir and um, also have some wonderful treats. If you'd like to come, we're doing a, this is funny. The choir's like, what is that? A $10 musical gift exchange. That could be a singing birthday card, maracas, whatever you can think of. So we are just very excited to share new music as well to worship the Lord. That evening, we're gonna celebrate with a special singer. Steve Smith is gonna come and sing for us during the evening service and preacher will have the preaching right after Amen. but we will take up a love offering for steve smith praise the lord all right anybody else have an announcement she was good to see you it's good to be in the house of the lord today amen. amen thank you for being here today and for those who are watching by way of of internet thank you for joining us today here at austin road let's go to the lord in prayer thank you father for all you're doing for us today what you've already done for us today, Lord, your blessings that you have bestowed upon us, the beautiful sunshine you brought our way today, Lord, we're grateful for that, and a time that we can meet together in, as a church body and worship you, Lord. Thank you for every soul that's here this morning, and I pray before we leave here today, we'll hear a word from you, Lord. We just pray today, Father, we give all of our energy toward worshiping and honoring you today, in Jesus' name, and all God's children said loudly, Amen. Amen. Psalm 116, 12 says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? Let's stand and sing to God be the glory.
this morning. That's right. He has raised me. Amen. John 12, 28 says, Father, glorify thy name. Let's sing to the Lord today. from Hebrews 9, 22. Glory to his name. Sing it out, church.
We'll be singing, In Christ Alone, Our Hope is Found, Because Jesus Paid It All. Amen.
come and gather around the altar this morning as we pray together. We want to remember this morning Miss Sarah Timms, Brother Jason Lynch, James Larry and Pat Smith. We also want to remember Dida this morning, Bob Viverman, Miss Shirley Andrews, Leonard McCoy. It sure is good this morning to see Brother Charles back with us and uh, after his procedure was done, and we were so grateful for that. Brad and Susan, who have been out for a little while, and they've been sick, and, and we want to continue to remember them as well. Let's also remember the lost of our community. Those who are hurting today, our soldiers who are abroad, and their families. Good to see Mr. Hendry with us today. We're so grateful he's with us today. Praise God. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing for us today. We are grateful today that you have allowed us to come and gather ourselves together in corporate worship. Our purpose for being here today, Lord, is to honor you, to glorify you, to lift up your name. For you are worthy of our praise. We're so grateful, Father, that you know who we are, that you know all about us, that you love us, and your son died for us and rose from the dead and made a promise to all of us he would return and receive unto himself that where he is, there we shall be also. We're so grateful, Father. Today, Lord, we pray that your spirit will move in our midst. The needs that are here are many, Lord. There are physical needs. There are emotional needs. There are spiritual needs. There's monetary needs. And we just pray here this morning, Father, that you fill each one of those. And Lord, if there's a need here this morning for salvation, I pray that that person's heart will be, it will swell up today, Lord. Just walk down that aisle and kneel at this altar and ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do here today. In Jesus' holy, holy name, we do humbly pray. Amen and amen. You sang, Brother Junior. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. And uh, last Sunday, Preacher Billy asked us, where are we going? And uh, Preacher Billy, I can tell you, I'm going there. Where the streets are made with gold, where the milk and honey flow, where we never grow old. Uh, we got four young girls that's going there. They just got saved recently. And they're going there. Miss Gail Ball had a birthday today. By her own testimony, she's going there. Amen. And I hope everybody in here is going there. That place is heaven. Uh, Y'all, Jay, go with number one. Uh, this is sort of a fast song. Y'all pray I don't run out of breath, okay? <laughs> All right, here we go. my eyes 
because I had to call somebody else to preach. <laughs> Praise the Lord, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Take our Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 20. A very familiar passage of Scripture. Preach from it I don't know how many times. But each time God gives me something else that's in these words and I am grateful for that. The title of this morning's message is You Better Hurry Up. And uh, you say, well, why do I need to hurry up? C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Screwtape Letters, there's a legend about Satan and his demons planning their strategy for attacking the world that's hearing the message of salvation. And one of the demons says, I've got the plan, Master. And when I get on earth and take charge of people's thinking, I'll tell them there's no heaven. And the devil responds, oh, they'll never believe that. The book of truth is full of messages about hope of heaven through sins forgiven. They won't believe that. They know there's a glory yet in the future. And on the other side of the room, another demon steps up and says, I've got the plan. I'll tell them there's no hell. The devil said, that's not good either. Jesus, while he was on earth, talked more of hell than of heaven. They know in their hearts that they're wrong and will have to take care of, of it in some way, somehow. They deserve nothing more than hell. And one brilliant little demon in the back stood up and said, Master, then I know the answer. I'll just tell them there's no hurry. And he's the one Satan chose. You better hurry up. Time is drawing nigh. Let's take a look at the great white throne judgment. Here's what it says in God's word. Then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oftentimes we don't see the necessity of getting in a hurry. We don't see the necessity of rushing up our lives. I told someone not too long ago, I said, don't rush me, I'm old. I done got too old to get in a hurry. But somehow these verses of Scripture sort of give us a, a time span. First thing I want you to notice about the Scripture is the time. The judgment takes place more than a thousand seven years after the rapture of the church, after the tribulation period, after the millennial kingdom, after the thousand year captivity of Satan and hell, after the final battle of Gog and Mogog, or Magog, after Satan is cast into the lake of fire, after the earth has been destroyed. This will happen just before the new heaven and new earth are created for us to 
in joy for eternity. The judgment will take place at the throne of God. It says there in verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne. It's called great and white. Great because there is none greater. It's God's final court. There's no higher court in which you can appeal. It is the supreme court of heaven. It is His throne of judgment. Therefore, it's called great because God sits on this throne. It is white. And why is it white? Because white is the symbol of purity of His judgment and justice. There, during this judgment, there's no politics involved. There's no bribery. There's no plea bargaining. No gain time. Just the pure, holy, and righteous justice of God being poured out. It's at the throne. This isn't like the throne in Revelation chapter 4, where we see a rainbow and mercy. There's no mercy at this throne. There's only judgment. And I say that we need to be in a hurry to to finalize things with our spiritual life because if you die without Jesus, you will face this judgment regardless. There's no getting out of it. There's no bypassing it. I want you to notice the participants. Only the lost will be at the great white throne judgment. Everyone here will enter the lake of fire to be eternally condemned with Satan. So if you make this judgment, there is no way out. There is no bargaining, as we've already said, no bribery. No gain time. There's nothing hidden there that God has this little secret behind His throne and maybe, just maybe, just maybe, He'll pull that little secret out just for me. No. It's not going to work that way. Well, how will a righteous, loving compassionate God, why would He do that to the creations that He's created? Because He's a God of righteousness. Because He's a God of justice. Let me ask you this. Would it be right for God not to bring judgment upon those who have refused Him and His Son had refused to obey Him, would it be right for those who had done that? No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be right for those who are born-again believers who have followed the command of God, had obeyed God and followed the laws of God and accepted Jesus as their Savior and asked to be forgiven of their sins. It wouldn't be right for them to enter into glory with those who have accepted Christ as Savior because they haven't glorified God. They haven't obeyed God. Notice in verse 12 who they are. I saw the dead, the small and great, I saw the dead. They are spiritually dead. There are are two ways to die. And only one way to live. You can be, you're already dead spiritually if you're lost. And then there's a physical death. Two different things. 
spiritually dead is so much more important than physical death. Because spiritual death leads you away from God instead of toward God. Physically dead, you just die in a physical body. And what you have prepared with your spirit is determined at that time when you die. There's no turning back from that. What you have prepared for is what you will get. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Hell is a prepared place for those who made no preparations except to die and go to hell. So they prepared too by doing nothing about their spiritual life. So, the spiritually dead, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. They were never born again. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to give us life. But these people have refused to be awakened by Jesus spiritually. They are spiritually dead. Then you have the small and great. Social status doesn't matter with God. God isn't influenced by money, reputation, or even morality. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 16, For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You see, both the small and great will stand before God. They will stand condemned because of their sin. You say, well, what is the small and great? The small is those just a common everyday person. The great is ones who are great in their own eyes. Maybe presidents, maybe kings. Maybe the rich, maybe the famous, great in our eyes and their eyes, but not great in God's eyes. And by the way, how much sin does it take to condemn a person? How much poison does it take in a glass of water to make it deadly? The glass may contain 99% water and only 1% poison, but the whole glass is condemned. And deadly. How much sin does it take to condemn a person to hell? You see, the Bible tells us we were born into sin. And we are 100% sinful by nature. The question that I just asked, it it isn't relevant. The glass contains 100% poison. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages, the payment of sin. But then, this is the final judgment. But who is the judge? Well, the judge isn't named here, but we know who he is. According to John 5, 2, the judges no man all judgment of the son. You see, because Jesus died on Calvary for our sins, because he was sinless, he has the right to be the judge, the jury, the prosecuting attorney, and the witness. After all, it was his his grace that 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 was turned away, that was refused. He is the one who was rejected. It's only fair that Jesus is the one to be judged, be the judge at the great white throne. That's fair. God is a just God. He's going to do what is fair, what is right. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto unto the Father but by me. You see, all this time, man has tried to hide his sins. 
under the blanket of respectability. He decorates his immorality with bows and ribbons. This day and time, the morality of man is, is, is he doesn't care what people think. He doesn't care what God thinks. He doesn't care what his family thinks. He doesn't care what his neighbor thinks. He only cares about what he thinks. Well, the truth will come out at this judgment. They will be seen for who they are. Spiritually dead. Not alive in Christ. They haven't gotten away with their sin. The Bible tells us to be sure your sins will find you out. At this judgment, your sins will find you out. Maybe they were never exposed to the gospel on earth. Never caught. Never condemned. Maybe they were accepted by society, which it seems like that is the case. The more sinful it seems, the, the more acceptance they receive by this society we live in. But you see, this is the great white throne judgment. Nothing has escaped the eye of the omnis uh, omniscient judge. He sees everything. All secrets will be revealed. Secret sins, secret thoughts, the secret intents of the heart. The evidence will be presented. There won't be a, a high paid defense attorney to, to get you off. No hung jury. No loophole in the law. No evidence that has, that has been compromised or withheld. Everything will be revealed. Everything. The judge is in charge. You won't have a say so. You stand before God. As the judge. With nothing to stand on. Nothing. Well what will be judged? How, how will this judgment go? Will it just be that you stand there and he says guilty, 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 guilty. No, we have a God of, of righteousness. We, we serve a God that is a just God. We serve a God that's going to prove. Prove why you are judged. All the evidence will be there. The Bible says in verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were opened. Now he says books. And another book was open, he says, book, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. In the books. You have multiple books. You have the book of life. You're not judged by the book of life. We'll get to that in a moment. You're judged by the evidence that your life has been charted by God. All the evidence is written down. Everything. All of our intentions, our motives, our sins, every thought, every word and deed has been recorded. Not one thing has been left out. Nothing too small or incidental to be recorded. There won't be even one good work there in those books. Well, what about the good things I did? Won't they count for anything? I went to church. I tithed. 
I was a pillar in the community. I was a good father. I was a good wife. I was a good neighbor. I was a good child. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please God. It also says in Romans chapter 14, verse 23, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Wow. So you see, if you aren't his child, all the good in the world won't please him. And you get into heaven, it's not going to happen. So, all your good works won't get you there. All your giving doesn't get you there. All your singing, all your preaching, all your teaching, all your good works toward your neighbor, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, whoever it might be, that's not what gets you there. It's faith and faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work on Calvary and nothing else. At the great white throne, if you're not a child of God, your good works will mean nothing. Zero. Zilch. Why? Because you're a child of the devil. You're not God's child. All your good works will be tainted by sin. Defiled. They won't be worth anything at the great white throne. Multitudes of people say they want to be judged by their good works. That's what they're counting on. But you see, the Bible contradicts that. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved. Only saved people go to heaven. Nobody saved will be at the great white throne judgment. That's set aside just for the unsaved. So it's not your works. Jesus, the, the Bible says so. It's not your works. Well, what's the purpose of the great white throne judgment? It is to reward the wicked for their wickedness. They aren't judged out of the book of life. They're judged out of the books where their life is recorded. There are no good works that they can point to because salvation doesn't come by works. What happened to their good works that they did here on earth? The Bible says in verse 11, they're going to be standing there with all their good works burned up. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it whose face, who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. The word them in there is not heaven and earth. It is those who stand face to face with God. They have nothing to hide behind. No mountains no scenery, no trees, no oceans, nothing. Their monuments that they have built will be gone. Their charities that they have gave, uh, given to will be destroyed. The churches that they attended have been dissolved. They have no treasure stored up in heaven. They have no inheritance because they aren't a child of God. Their whole life centered on planet earth. And now it's gone. They have nothing to point to. It's all gone. The books will condemn them. The book of life is just there to support the verdict. An awful blank will your name be where, where nowhere to be seen. 
scratched out. We don't have your name in our book. In verse 13 we see the trial. This trial is not for Jesus to see proof of your sin. He already knows that. It's for the lost to see their sin. They will see that they don't have a leg to stand on. The verdict is obvious. Guilty. No one, no lost person is exempt from this trial. All the lost will appear. The sea will give up the dead. The second resurrection will take place. The resurrection of all the lost. The Bible says in John chapter 5, it says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Hmm. Well, what about the rewards? The purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is to reward His bride. Now, this this is another. uh, 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 the, The judgment seat of Christ is the seat that Christ sits on to give the saved, the Christian, the born again believer, his or her rewards. But the lost. It's a reward, if you could call it that, for those who rejected him. Take a look at the verdict in verse 14. Then the death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Hmm. Hmm. And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, there is death after life. Did you know that? And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Death is just the beginning of eternity. Where you spend eternity is determined before you die the first time. Afterwards it's too late. If you're a Christian, you are born twice and you die once. If you're lost, you are born once and you die twice. This is the second death. It's the gateway to the lake of fire. Verse 15 says there is no appeal. The verdict is final. The penalty is eternal torment in the lake of fire. No hope, no peace, and no end. Now someone may say, well, if God is a God of justice, all my good works that are in that book certainly... I won't get all the punishment that everybody else gets. Will there be degrees of punishment in hell? I believe that there will be, just like there will be degrees of reward in heaven for the saved. I believe that there are those who had never heard the gospel or had the opportunity to be saved, won't suffer the same as those who blatantly rejected the gospel of salvation. The Bible says in verse, uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 14, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. But listen. Hell is hell. It's hot. It stinks. It's separation from God with no opportunity to ever, ever, ever go to heaven. It doesn't, it doesn't diminish or negate the fact that hell is a place of torment. So don't think, well, I, I, I'll, get, I'll have it kind of a, a light down. There is no light duty in hell. There is no light punishment. It's all hot, burning, stinking, dark. Moaning, groaning, gnashing of teeth where the worm never dies. And neither can you die away from the punishment. 
The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You see, Jesus suffered on the, on the cross to suffer hell for you and me. He died to take our penalty upon Himself. He was condemned for our sin that you might escape condemnation. How shall anyone escape if they neglect so great a salvation? Jesus offers an alternative to the lake of fire. He says in John chapter 6, he says this in verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. You see what Jesus is saying in that, in that verse of Scripture is He wants to save you from the penalty of your sins. He didn't die just because it was something that He just thought might be a good idea. Jesus died for a particular reason. He rose from the dead for a particular reason. And that was to save you and me. Give us an opportunity to not die and go to hell and be punished. When he said, I am the way, I am the way, he meant I am the only way. You will not go to heaven any other way than through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It can't happen. It won't happen. It has never happened. If, it, if that be the case, then our Lord died for no reason. If there was another way to get man to heaven, God would have told us. But he said there is no other way. We are lost sinners. And if you're saved, you're saved by the grace of God. Through, Jesus, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. No one else, nothing else, not anything at all can take the place of Jesus Christ. Death, burial, and resurrection. So get that thought out of your mind. Unless you come to Jesus Christ by faith in Him, seeking salvation for your soul, asking in your heart and in your mind, being convicted of your sin, coming to the only one that you can come to by faith. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Believe in your heart that He died on Calvary's cross and rose from the dead to save you from your sins. Unless you do that, you will not ever go to heaven. And you will go to hell. Period. Final. You will stand before God in this judgment. I don't care what anybody else has ever told you. Whatever other book that has been written. My friends, it is not stronger. It is not more truth than this book. For this is the book. The book. The Bible, his story, history, this is it. So what will you do? You better hurry up, because time is coming. Jesus wants you to save you from the penalty of your sins and the Lord and be the Lord of your life. If you have never Come to Jesus Christ. Why don't you come to Him now before it's too late? Well, preacher, maybe He'll give me another day. Would you be... Why would you want to, to gamble with your soul? Why would you want to take a chance in dying and going to hell with no opportunity to ever get out of there? My friends, it's not a temporary place. It is eternal just like heaven is. There is no escape. What will you do? It's all a matter of believing. 
It's all a, all a matter of being convicted in your heart. Is God telling you today that you are a sinner? Is the, is the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of your heart this morning saying, Look, you know you're lost. You know you've never asked me to forgive you of your sins. My friends, I want to tell you something about that. If He's convicting you this morning. There's a verse of Scripture in the Bible that says, the Spirit of God will not always strive with man. And I want to tell you this. You can believe it or not. But the Scripture tells us it's true. That if you aren't convicted by the Holy Spirit, you can't just come to Jesus anytime you think you can. There must be conviction in your heart. Jesus said, all that my Father gave to me comes to me. Won't you come to him this morning? He said, well, preacher, I, I'm going to wait another day. Go ahead. Go ahead. If something happens to you today, I'll have to stand here and preach your funeral. What will I say? Oh, he was a good man, a good woman. Loved a lot of people, did a lot of things, but died without Jesus and now abides in hell. I can't say any other thing than that. I'm not going to lie. It's your choice. God gave us that choice. What will you do? Father, as we pray this morning, I pray if there's a lost soul in our midst, they understand that time is drawing nigh. For no one knows the hour, as we said last week. No one knows the day but you, Lord. Time is drawing nigh. You could come at any moment to take your children home. But none other than your children would be able to go. If there's a lost person here this morning, Lord, I pray that you've convicted their heart and they'll do something about it this morning. Maybe a, a wandering child of yours wants to come back to you, Lord. Your arms are wide open to receive them. Maybe someone wants to join this fellowship. Maybe someone listening this morning by way of Internet. Would you bow down this morning on your hands and knees wherever you may be? And pray this prayer. If you're convicted by the Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I've sinned against you and you alone. Would you forgive me of my sins? I come to you, Lord, because I have no other place to go. I have no one else to go to. And I've sinned against you. Would you forgive me and wash me clean? I accept you as my Lord. If you prayed that prayer, God will save you. I believe, Lord, you rose from the dead. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for us. Would you come this morning? Father, thank you for what you have done, what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Move immediately.